So the second part of the cutaneous membrane is the dermis. And we know that this is the tissue that lies directly deep to the epidermis. So this is the tissue that supports the epidermis. It lies between the epidermis and the hypodermis, which is also referred to as the subcutaneous or the subq or the superficial fascia. It is in the dermis where we find the accessory structures of the integument. We can also say epidermal accessory structures such as the hair follicle and sweat glands. They contain all the cells of connective tissue proper. They also contain a network of blood vessels and nerve fibers. And we also know that there are two major components to the dermis. So we have the papillary layer that roughly makes 20% of the dermis, and this is the superficial layer or the superficial part of the dermis, and it consists of areolar connective tissue which if you remember is an example of connective tissue proper. What we find in the papillary layer among the areolar connective tissue are the smaller blood vessels, the capillary, something that we'll look at later on, the lymphatics and sensory neurons. It also has dermal papillae projecting between epidermal ridges. Dermatitis is an inflammation of the skin and it usually involves the papillary layer. However, it can spread across the entire integument. It is caused by infection, radiation, mechanical irritation, and chemicals such as poison ivy. And it's characterized by itch and as well as pain. Just on a side note, if it happens to be poison ivy, the last thing you want to do is scratch it despite its itchiness because otherwise you're just going to spread the chemicals and now your dermatitis will then extend to a greater surface area of your skin. The second major component of the dermis is the reticular layer. And we know that this is roughly 80% of the dermis and it lies deep to the papillary layer. So the type of connective tissue that we find in the reticular layer is the dense irregular collagenous connective tissue. So that means it's densely packed, it is not loose connective tissue as what we have with areolar connective tissue, instead, it's jam-packed, densely packed with collagen that happens to go in many different directions, and that's why it's dense, irregular, collagenous. But please note, even though collagen fibers are the predominant connective tissue fibers that make up dense, irregular, collagenous connective tissue, we also have to take note that we also have elastic fibers. All right, so we have, once again, mostly collagen fibers, but we also have elastic fibers. It is in the reticular layer where we find the larger blood vessels. Again, something that we're going to discuss later on. We also have lymphatic vessels that I don't really care for you to know just yet. It has nerve fibers. This is also where we find the hair follicles, the sebaceous gland, which are the oil glands, and the sudoriferous glands, which are also known as sweat glands. So this image over here shows us once again the epidermis, and the dermis with the papillary layer and the reticular layer. And if we look at the image down below, we could see the papillary layer of the dermis. And once again, this is your areolar connective tissue. And directly beneath that is the reticular layer of the dermis. So what you're looking at these strands, ladies and gentlemen, so that's your rope-like protein collagen going many different directions. And hence, it's dense, irregular, collagenous connective tissue. And among all those collagen fibers are these elastic fibers. So now let's talk about what gives strength, extensibility, and elasticity of skin. So we've just mentioned the two types of connective tissue fibers in the previous slide that are associated with the dermis. We have the collagen fibers, which are very strong, rope-like in structure, and they resist stretching. We also have the elastic fibers that are similar to rubber bands in that we can stretch, and then when we let go, it snaps back into place. And that's exactly what elastic fibers are designed for. So they permit stretching and then recoil to the original length. And this is what's gonna provide extensibility, meaning we can stretch our skin and for it to recoil, meaning it gives elasticity to skin. Now, skin turgor 
is a property of flexibility and resilience. And it's a good indicator whether or not the person is dehydrated or hydrated, meaning they've drank or they've consumed enough fluid. So one of the things you can do to determine whether or not the individual is dehydrated or hydrated is to do this skin turgor test. And what that involves is you pinch the dorsum of their hand. And if it tense, then that tells you that that individual has not consumed enough fluid. In other words, they're dehydrated. And if it goes back to their original state, then that means they've drunk enough fluid. They're hydrated. Sagging and wrinkling of the skin is basically when we lose elasticity. So the skin has lost its skin elasticity or has reduced its elasticity. And it could be caused by dehydration, it could be caused by age, which is part of the normal aging process, hormonal changes, and as well as ultraviolet light exposure. Incidentally, ultraviolet light or ultraviolet radiation quickly destroys these elastic fibers. Another thing that can happen to our skin is the formation of stretch marks. So what happens here is basically it's a thickened tissue or scar tissue resulting from the excessive stretching of our skin. And basically the skin does not snap back into place. And so what you end up noticing are these stripe-like appearance. And this could be due to pregnancy and it could also be due to rapid weight gain and or rapid weight loss. Another thing I'd like to talk about is what we call the lines of cleavage, which is also called tension lines. So it turns out that those collagen fibers and elastic fibers that we find in the dermis are arranged in parallel bundles. So they resist force in a specific direction, but also we could see the pattern or the arrangement in which they run. And these white lines that you see in this image are these lines of cleavage or tension lines. So if we look carefully, you can see that we have these white lines going across the abdominal region, sort of in a bleak fashion, and that is showing us the direction in which these collagen fibers and these elastic fibers run within the dermis. And if we look at the gluteal region on the posterior part of the image, you can see they're running in this direction. If an incision or a cut is made along the length of these lines of cleavage, also called tension lines, then the wound heals rather quickly and the formation of scar tissue is greatly diminished. However, if you cut across or you cut against the lines of cleavage or tension lines, then what ends up happening is it doesn't heal very quickly. And also the wound tends to open and it also increases the likelihood of forming scar tissue. So this slide shows us some additional images of these lines of cleavage or these tension lines. So as I was saying in the previous slide, that if we make an incision along the same direction or parallel to these lines of cleavage, then the likelihood of forming a scar tissue is greatly diminished. And the reason why is because we don't have this gap. It just basically seals much, much better, which obviously will increase healing time. So if we look at this image over here, you can see that, all right? And as well as over here, as long as we cut along the same direction of these lines of cleavage, this is the result that we're going to have. However, if we cut perpendicular, or if we cut against, or if we cut at 90 degree angle, along those lines of cleavage as what you see over here, okay, what ends up happening is we don't have that nice seal. It tends to gap, it tends to open, which will increase healing time and also increase the likelihood of forming scar tissue. So we can see it in this image and we can also see it in this image. So what I'd like to now do is take a side step and talk about the three types of blood vessels because this is going to be related to what we're going to be talking about with the next slide. So the three types of blood vessels that I would like you to know, number one are the arteries, number two are the capillaries, and number three are the veins. So what I've diagrammed for you is the systemic circulation. Now it all begins with 
the heart, right? So our heart basically functions as a pump. So arteries, ladies and gentlemen, will deliver blood away from the heart, all right? So when blood leaves the heart, it's going to leave through an artery. So one way you can remember that is think of A for artery as a way, all right? So it delivers blood away from the heart. So from the artery, it will branch into smaller and smaller arteries until we get to these smallest arteries called the arterioles. So arterioles, ladies and gentlemen, are the smallest branches of arteries. So let's go ahead and write that down. So arterioles are the smallest branches of the arteries. From the arterioles, they move, or I should say blood flows into the capillaries, which is the second type of blood vessel. Now, what happens at the capillaries? At the capillaries is where we exchange substances. So I like to say the capillaries are the site of exchange of substances. So what are some of the substances that are exchanged at the capillary? Is oxygen. So I'm going to go ahead and draw an arrow like this to indicate that oxygen leaves the capillary and enters the area where we find our tissue cells. So these two circles that I've drawn are the tissue cells. So the oxygen will be picked up by our tissue cells. So this is one of the substances that ex is exchanged at the capillaries. Another substance that's also exchanged at the capillaries are the nutrients, right? So you can think of glucose or amino acids, for example. So these are the nutrients. So the nutrients essentially will be taken up by the cell. Now, we also remember that cells produce wastes, right? So one of those is carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide that's produced by our tissue cells, well, that's going to be picked up by the capillary. So once again, this is what I'm referring to as capillaries as the site of exchange. So materials are being exchanged, and as well as waste products, right? We can't forget that cells also produce other wastes, and uh, this will also end up in the capillary. So I hope you can see that we have a lot of exchanging happening at the capillary. So from the capillary, blood continues to flow. So you need to remember blood does not stop. It has to continue to flow. So long as our heart continues to pump or to beat, this circulation will continue. All right, so then from the capillaries, blood flows into the venules. So what are venules? Venules are the smallest branches of veins. So let's go ahead and write that down. So venules are the smallest branches of veins, just like arterioles are the smallest branches of arteries. So from here, what we have is converging. In other words, the venules start to fuse together. They converge, they come together, and they converge into veins. So from veins, blood is delivered back to the heart. So the way you can also remember that is think of the V as a funnel. Okay, so let me draw the V as the funnel, and if this is the heart, veins basically drain blood back to the heart. So once again, Arteries deliver blood away from the heart, and veins deliver blood back to the heart. Now, arteries, ladies and gentlemen, as far as the systemic circulation is concerned, is usually drawn in a red color, okay? So whenever we're looking at systemic circulation, we often indicate arteries with the color red. That means that arteries have a high level of oxygen and a low level of carbon dioxide. Furthermore, arteries will also have a high concentration of nutrients. So basically, what arteries are doing is delivering the oxygen and the nutrients to our tissue cells. And then when blood arrives at the capillaries, it leaves the capillaries to nourish our cells. Now, veins, as far as systemic circulation is concerned, is usually indicated with a blue color. And the reason being is this means 
that we have the opposite. We have low levels of oxygen and high carbon dioxide. Now, what about the waste? Well, it turns out, instead of having high amounts of nutrients, it has high amounts of wastes. So this is as far as I need you to know, as far as the blood vessels and the systemic circulation. Just remember, blood flows only in one direction. So once again, from arteries to capillaries, from capillaries to veins, and then back to the heart. So let's now talk about the dermal blood supply. Basically, we're going to look at the blood vessels that we find in the dermis. Now, there is a term called plexus that I need you to know. And basically, plexus just, is just another way of saying network. So we could have a network of blood vessels or we could have a network of nerves. So basically, we could have a plexus of blood vessels or a plexus of nerves. So we have to be clear when we use the word plexus. Do you mean blood vessels or do you mean nerves? Well, in this particular slide, we're going to focus on blood vessels. So we're going to be looking at plexuses of blood vessels. Once again, network of blood vessels. So what I've done is I've created this diagram on the right side of the slide. And here is the heart. All right, so let's look at the heart. And we know, based on our last slide's discussion, that blood leaves the heart via the artery, right? So one of the first plexuses that we want to look at is the subcutaneous plexus. The term subcutaneous plexus is totally appropriate. Basically, what this is saying is there's a network of blood vessels found in the subcutaneous, the hypodermis, the sub-Q, also called the superficial fascia. From there, blood flows up to the next network of blood vessels, this time a network of blood vessels found in the reticular layer. Now, where exactly in the reticular layer is the next plexus found? The cutaneous plexus is what we're looking at. So that's going to be found just above the sub-Q. So basically, it's found in the very depths, in the deepest part of the reticular layer, just before we get to the subcutaneous layer. So what we're looking at right now is the cutaneous plexus. So blood travels from the subcutaneous plexus, once again, network of blood vessels found in the sub-Q. It moves upward to the cutaneous plexus, and then it continues to travel up to the next plexus that we find in the dermis, and that's the subpapillary plexus. So if we look at this word sub, that just means below. So this is directly below the papillary layer of the dermis. Okay, so this is the other blood vessel, network of blood vessels found in the dermis. From there, blood continues up into the capillary. And we're going to call these capillaries capillary loops. So these capillary loops are found in the dermal papilla. So I'll make another drawing, right? This is the dermal papilla. So this capillary loop that this is talking about is found literally at this mount, this dermal papilla. So what is it doing there? Well, what it's going to do is it's going to exchange material. That's what capillaries are. They're the site of exchange. So in other words, oxygen leaves the capillary loop. If I go back to my drawing over here, it leaves the capillary. And this is what's going to provide nourishment to the cells of the epidermis, your stratum basale cells, your stratum spinosa, right? Those keratinocytes or keratinocytes are very much alive. So it's going to provide oxygen. It's going to provide nutrients. At the same time, these keratinocytes will produce carbon dioxide. So the capillary loops will pick up the CO2 produced by the keratinocytes of the stratum basale and the stratum spinosum, and to a certain extent, some of the cells in the stratum granulosum, the so-called dying layer where keratinocytes or keratinocytes are dying, okay? So from the capillary loops, it then drains into the subpapillary plexus. So what we're now looking at basically are veins, okay? So the blue, once again, is the vein. So it drains into the subpapillary plexus, continues downward through the cutaneous plexus, eventually arriving at the subcutaneous plexus. And take note, I have vein written there. So then eventually, we know that veins will drain blood back to the heart.
So if we refer to this image that I drew, or this diagram that I drew to the left, this capillary loop basically picks up the CO2 produced by the keratinocytes or keratinocytes in the stratum basale and the stratum spinosum. So I have some images that I found that illustrates these plexuses. Don't forget, these are plexuses of blood vessels. So if we just quickly go through this image, here is your subcutaneous plexus, right, found in the sub Q. Here is your cutaneous plexus found in the very depths or the deepest part of the reticular layer. Here's my subpapillary plexus found directly deep to the papillary layer of the dermis. And we can't forget the capillary loop. So folks, this is what's going to nourish. This is what's going to provide the oxygen and nutrients to the cells of not only the epidermis, but as well as the cells that we find in the dermis, as well as all those accessory structures that we're gonna be eventually talking about that we find in the dermis. Contusion is when we damage these blood vessels. So in other words, if you, with enough force, if we hit our skin or integument, then some of these blood vessels will rupture. And when they rupture, it then eventually will give us this black and blue, basically bruising, and that's a contusion.